Well, welcome everyone to the fourth in a series of webinars by the PyroLife International Symposium towards an integrated fire management. Uh, we have 384 people registered uh, today. So very happy that everyone is uh, a part of this and, and, and welcome along. Uh, a good morning to a lot of folks from the US and North America who are uh, coming in. Uh, good afternoon, of course, to many in, in Europe. And uh, I now happy tomorrow to folks in Australia who have registered. Uh, my name is uh, Lucian Deaton. I work with the National Fire Protection Association on our wildfire management uh, community engagement and our international outreach. I'm going to share some of the technical aspects of today's webinar with you, and then we have two great speakers uh, for the next hour and a half. Uh, we'll have the two speakers. Each will speak for half an hour. There will be a time about 15 minutes for questions after those presentations. Uh, the audio and visual is turned off for participants, but what you can do is at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. That's where we ask you to put your questions uh, and not into the chat function because some of them can kind of get lost, but in that Q&A box, then we can take those and uh, we'll prepare them for the speakers. Um, during the session, please do those. And if it is easier to write them in your own language, uh, that's just fine. We have the ability to translate it. Uh, the questions will be posed and answered in English, but if it's easier for you to write in your own language, uh, we're happy for that and we encourage it uh, so that um, you can really get your question across. Uh, diversity is very important to power of life as well. And uh, we encourage uh, young researchers, women, others to uh, post your questions. Uh, don't be shy about them being in the, in the uh, the, the discussion. Uh, the presentations are being recorded. Uh, they'll be on the Power of Life YouTube channel, on the symposium webpage, and on Twitter, that Power of Life symposium hashtag we encourage you to use uh, for comments, discussions that you have uh, during this, and of course, after to keep the conversation going from what we'll hear today. I want to introduce the two speakers that we have this morning. Uh, Bertram DeRoy is um, a registered landscape architect and senior researcher at uh, Wageningen Univer uh, University in their environmental research uh, uh, department. He focuses on landscape-based adaptation, risk reduction, and regional development and a diverse portfolio of projects. He's also an active uh, volunteer firefighter for over the past 15 years. So certainly thank you for your service there. Uh, the presentation that he'll be giving today is Enabling Landscapes, Appealing Narratives About Wildfires in Perspective. And then the second presentation that we'll have, and we're happy to have uh, Fulko Ludwig with us this morning. Uh, he's a professor of water systems and global change group at Wageningen University as well, and has a background in climate impact modeling and data analysis and extensive field experience in Africa, Australia, the US and Asia. And he'll be speaking on living with fire. What can we learn from the experiences in the water sector uh, environment? So, Foco, please introduce yourself, of course, more fully, and, and we look forward to learning from you today. Good. Share my screen. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sure. thank you. So, yeah, I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about the experience in, in, in living with with water and, and, and with fire, and especially from a more adaptive water management point of view, and how we could translate some of these lessons into adaptive fire management. But let me, let me start with introducing myself a little bit. Um, so I don't have a background in fire, uh, although I do a lot with water, I'm also not a hardcore hydrologist. So I actually have a background in, in ecology and I do have lived in uh, a lot of areas where, where fire uh, plays an important role. And so I lived in, in Africa, in Tanzania for three years for my PhD. I think there also were a lot of communities who, you know, use fire to manage their landscape. I think they're pretty good in living with, uh, with fire. Um, I worked in Utah uh, uh, for, for two years in the deserts there. Uh, um, and there actually we were working in some sand dunes and we were... Uh, we were sharing our facilities with the, uh, with the local fire uh, uh, fires there. Um, then I, I moved to, uh, to Australia and Perth, working more on climate change impacts and attrition uh, in relation to land use, dry land agriculture. And then I moved back to the Netherlands 
to work a lot more on, uh, on water. And currently I'm a, a professor in water and climate change. Um, I work within the Water Systems and Global Change Group. Um, and this is very much a multidisciplinary group. So we try to tackle the issues of global change from, from different angles. So we have people with backgrounds in biology, physics, agricultural sciences, hydrology, social water management, and because we think we need these different backgrounds to, to tackle the, the, the new challenges that uh, have reached upon us. And I think that's also very interesting about this project uh, where we have people from a very broad range of backgrounds to work on, uh, on these, uh, these fire issues. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, so um, I'm going to give a short history of water management in the, in the Netherlands uh, to give a bit of an idea where we come from and how we came to the idea of more living with water. Uh, and that very much has to do with this uncertain future that we're dealing with and that we have to some extent embraced what are these principles of adaptive flood management and, and how can we then maybe use that in adaptive fire management. And I'll just give some ideas about that. As I said, I'm not a fire specialist, but I think there are possible lessons from the water sector, uh, which we can actually use in, in, uh, in adaptive fire management. Um, so very thankful for actually the question about uh, evacuation, uh, because that has been something I've tried personally stretch in the Netherlands to have an evacuation plan, but to enlighten on it, there is no evacuation plan. And maybe that's also why we go to this living with water. Um, I was once with a presentation where uh, a person spent about three quarters of his presentation to actually explain why we cannot evacuate. So, uh, and there's some truth in that. Uh, there is just too many people uh, stuck in, in, in one part of the country. And, and once the flood starts, it's very hard to evacuate them. So they talk a little bit about what they call horizontal evacuation, so maybe to, uh, to higher buildings, et cetera. But in the end, I mean, we are very uh, water-rich countries. We live in a delta and, and, and we've basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, put this delta in our control. Huh? And our main strategy initially was be actually shortening the coastline, straightening the rivers. So really keeping the water out was something which we've done for for, for centuries, and you see this changing landscape in the, in the figures where the Netherlands was built. And uh, after a number of floods, every time we, we, we protected our country better, we built more dikes, more polders. And so we have more land and basically uh, less water. Uh, and this is the, uh, the reclaiming land uh, as our polders has also been part of that strategy of keeping the water out. And that really has made our country much safer uh, we haven't had a major flood since the 1950s. We have very high flood protection strategies. Um, and these are some of the, the three, I think, past events for, from, from the 20th century that has basically built the country as it is now and how we look at it. So we've, we had a major flood in 1916 in the northern part. And that's when we started to build dikes in the north and developed some big polders there. Then in 1953, we had a major disaster in the southwest, and that's where we had our delta works, uh, very structural solutions with dams and barriers to keep the water out. Then in 93 and 95, we were actually very lucky, and these were actually near floods. So there was a major evacuation, there were very high water levels, but there wasn't in the end a major flood. But it was a major wake up call that. Uh, the threats come both from the rivers uh, and from the sea, and, and, and the threats also become more unpredictable, and we have to change the way that we improve, you know, approach uh, our water and flood management. Now, these were the delta works where the Netherlands are very famous on. Uh, a lot of our foreign gas, we take them to them, we show them all the dikes and dams and, and all these kind of structural works that we have. They work very good against flood protection, but they have a lot of negative impacts on our ecology. And we've also seen the limitations of these, these, these structural flood protection. They're very expensive. And if they break, you have a major failure. So we're trying to, to look at kind of changes, but still the main focus of dark flux management is about preventing floods. 
Yeah, and every time they try to make an evacuation plan after after studying for one, two years, think, nah, we cannot do that. And so we build another dike. That remains the core of it, huh? but still now we actually also, in addition to these dikes, uh, try to look at other issues, how we can make communities and the population and the country as a whole uh, uh, more resilient. Now, the game changer to, towards his living for water was the 1995 floods, or probably more near flood. And it's a, uh, it's a Dutch figure, but, but what I wanted to show, so 250,000 people were evacuated. So this river land area, we can evacuate, but it was a major, major decision. And so all the people living in these areas between the rivers were evacuated because the dikes were about to breach. In the end, this is not the, the flooded area. In the end, the major dikes did not break and we did not have a flood, but there was a major realization, hey, we need to do this different. And, and, and from flood protection, we much more went to what we call flood risk management. So can we manage the risks? I had the full focus on, on the protection. Uh, actually, people lost the ability to deal with floods and, and, and resulting in lower resilience. And this might also be the case now with fire, if people don't experience fire anymore, they think they're never going to happen. And when the major fire is there, you might be very, very uh, vulnerable. Um, there is a need to, to manage these risks much more proactively, huh? but also I think due to climate change, the flood risks become more uncertain. So we don't know what the future risks are. Huh? We thought we all knew how everything was going to happen and we have perfect models, but the future is uncertain and we need to take that into account. And that also means that full protection becomes almost impossible. And because, you know, and by, by involving communities, uh, they become more resilient. And also I think if we have multiple strategies and multiple levels of, of risk reduction, we can avoid uh, major disasters and also accept some risk uh, of flooding in at least part of the country. Now, another major game changer, I think, was also in, in the more international water management. And this was this paper in Nature, where they say, uh, which is called stationarity is that. Uh, uh, and then, you know, how do we change, uh, what do we do about that with water management? And, and up until, you know, some, some, some of the early 2000s, uh, most water management were assuming that, the, you know, historical di data is the, is the perfect prediction for the future. So by having a, a good data set of the, of the historical situation, we know what's gonna happen in the future and we can build our risk models on that. But because the climate is changing, also these risk profiles are changing. So we cannot assume that historical data is a good predictor of the future. We need something else. And we can use climate models, but there's all kinds of limitations there. So to some extent, we need to, to take that uncertainty into account and try and even embrace that if we can do that. Now, this, 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 this figure I want to show you what is some work that we did for the Rhine, which shows some uncertainties, but also some uncertainties. And what is shown here is on the left is the 10 day maximum precipitation in, in millimeters. And, and, and here on the right is the maximum discharge uh, for the Rhine when it enters the Netherlands. And these gray lines are based on historical data. So these are the, based on observations on historical analysis. And these red and blue lines, they're different climate models, different climate runs predicting these future risks. So what we see two things from this data. First of all, we see that the maximum precipitation is increasing and in almost all cases also the discharge is increasing. So that is clear. So our risks will increase in the future, but to how much, and if we look at discharge, huh? and if we look at the sort of one in thousand year flood, what we like to protect ourselves against in the Netherlands, which used to be 16,000 uh, cubic meters per second, now might become 17,000, which might be doable, but it could also be 20,000. And that is the kind of, that's a big range that you need to prepare yourself against. And, and that has a lot of implications for, uh, for water management, because if you go to this highest level, which basically means you might overinvest, it might cost a lot of money, you might actually need to move people away from areas, or do you go for the lower risk and you might actually you know, have a higher risk than you want. So there's a big uncertainty there in, in, uh, in how to deal with that. And that means that we actually, what we say in the Netherlands, need to become more, more adaptive. The same 
uh, uncertainty is in, in future sea level rise. This is a picture from our delta. So, uh, so by 2100, the sea level rise might be only 50 centimeters. It could be one more than one meters. Some recent analysis shows that it might go to two meters within the next 100 years. But also, also there it's uncertain. So to now already invest in two meter sea level rise might be an overinvestment, but maybe we need somewhere to prepare for that. Now, and this, this gives an idea of how some, some pressures that the deltas are, and this is a picture for the Netherlands, but the interesting factor is we work a lot in Vietnam and Bangladesh as well. I think Vietnam is also uh, the Mekong Delta, an area where they do live with water and especially economically, they've been very successfully in using the water for fisheries, for rice, etc. So there's some good examples there. I think what many of these initially we, we, we forget about it, the, the, the ecological value of the water when we when we try to develop it, uh, but also there I think we are we are getting better. But there's a number of, of different pressures, but at the same time it's also economically uh, very productive, but also agricultural, these deltas are very productive uh, because it's fertile and there is lots of water that you can use. And, and this is a some building blocks of adaptive flood and water management that uh, uh, is based on a paper from Pumbura et al. that we, some, some, some starting points that we use in the Netherlands. And, and, and one of it is accepting future, future uncertainty. And I think that's a very, important one, but that's for politicians very difficult. I mean, uh, I always say that scientists, and especially climate scientists, they love and embrace uncertainty, but politicians hate uncertainty, and they want to give certainty to their people. So that's a different. You can deal with uncertainty, you can accept it by developing different scenarios for the future. That's what we do a lot. You can develop these scenarios with communities and get to very interesting uh, results as, as, as one of these maps that we've developed for the Netherlands, but there's different ways to look at scenarios. Um, also, I think uh, we need to focus on learning by doing. So we need to start experimenting with uh, um, the kind of measures that we want to take. So when we creating more space for water, I'll tell a little bit more there, we started with small scale experiments around rivers, taking people with it and showing them that uh, this can also work. Um, because the future is uncertain, where you can look at reversible and more flexible options that has a preference above, you know, kind of more hardcore norm reversible kind of engineering options. Uh, you can often capitalize on no or low regret measures, focusing on win-win, what, what might work for water management, uh, might flood management, might also be net positive for ecology or agriculture. At the same time, I think we need to acknowledge the possibility of still future shocks in terms of, uh, uh, um, uh, of floods or maybe fires, but also maybe in things like uh, the, the shock that we, we are currently in. Um, and then what works very well in, in water management is where you combine some of the more softer measures in addition to the kind of more structural now, an example of living with water, I think, in Ellis is, is, is the, what we call the, the room for the river policy. So as I said in my initial talk, what we, what, we, what we initially did with the rivers is straightening them, very high dikes and embankments uh, to, to keep the rivers trained within this. Uh, and now we come to the conclusion that we need to give more space for water. Uh, so if we have a high water event, it uses the space to spread and, and reduce the flood velocity and reduce also our, uh, our flood risk. And at the same time, these new space that we create can be used for recreation, can be used for agriculture, but also for, uh, for nature. And, and, and this is a little bit what it looks like. So one of the first things is that we did is also uh, some of the obstacles that we had in the river about to remove them. We had some old, sh old stone factories, maybe very high trees, maybe some other structures which were not used. They were removed to, to make the, uh, the river more, uh, make more space basically for, for, for the river. Now, then and then we're moving dikes now away from the river. So we're not removing the, the dikes totally. Uh, that's, that's not possible when your land is below sea level, but you can actually move them a little bit more away from the river. So when you have a high water event, you can actually, uh, uh, you, you create more space for the, uh, for the river. 
Now, then you can have retention areas. So these areas uh, uh, where you can actually also keep the water uh, to prepare more for droughts or low flow events. These retention areas can also have multiple functions. You can use them for recreation. You can use them for, for irrigation uh, from other purposes. And now this is another way if you, if you cannot make space for the river because you might have some, uh, some villages there, you can actually make a sort of second channel uh, which is used in high water events, which again can also be a potentially very valuable area for, uh, for nature. And that's why we talk about, about green rivers. Now, and this is, this is an example. So the, the, the top is the old situation uh, where there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of agriculture still. Uh, and, and now in this situation, we've given more space for the water so the areas can flood and it's become a, a, a highly biodiverse area. So we've taken agricultural land away and giving that back to the water. So that's, oh sorry, that's possible for, for agricultural land, uh, not always easy because the farmers might not like this. Uh, of course, it is a very much hard, you know, almost impossible when it's sort of build up land with, where, where people are living. So if you have a whole town there, have a lot of houses there, then that's very difficult. Uh, and, and that's also what I say to people. Once you start somewhere, a, a city or a village, you have to protect it against floods. Uh, you can, uh, if you have agriculture, you can, you can maybe change that again back to nature. But... Uh, and that might be the same for also for, for looking at, at, at fire management. And when people start to, to live in forests or in, in fire sensitive areas, and one time you have to, to, uh, um, to also protect that. And, and maybe at the moment your fire risk is not very high, but it might change in 20, 30 years. And then when you have a lot of people living there, it's very hard to change your, your strategy. Now, this is, uh, this is not a single project. Uh, this, this map is to show you that these Run for the River projects are actually implemented throughout the Netherlands, a very big program. And again, uh, the, the, the primary focus is on, uh, on flood protection, but there is a lot of other benefits when we look at water as well. Uh, and here in all these projects, we try to embrace the water again and live with the water again, and not only um, and not only basically push the water out of the Netherlands as soon as possible. Now, other smart solutions. This is what we're also looking at is more what we call broad climate dikes. And so these are not higher dikes, but more, uh, more broader dikes. And, and the idea of these dikes is that they, they cannot breach. And that is actually, uh, so if the water overtops the dike, that's usually not a big problem. Uh, but if they breach, that might be in a, in a big impact. Now, this is a more local solution. This is in Rotterdam, the second biggest city in the Netherlands. Um, and here we try to, to uh, create an area. This is what we call a water plaza. And this was created to capture also flood water, but then from, from intensive rainfall events. So these are more for the, for the local floods. Eh? And also there, can you create space for water and live with water? So now eh, when it's not, when there's no heavy rainfall event, you can basically use it for recreation, eh, but in terms of a, a high intensive rainfall events, this can, can locally plot. Now, what, what does it learn us about fire? Eh, and I've, I've been thinking a little bit about that since I got involved in this, uh, this project. So what can we can learn from fire? This is just a, a map on changing fire risk. Eh, and uh, this is the sort of, present current uh, climate uh, uh, risk for fires. This is basically the change on the two degree global warming. That's basically what we have committed to. Uh, and this is for a high emission scenario. So what we can do is with mitigation, we can reduce the risk uh, from the high emission to the two degree global warming. But this is the changes in risk that we definitely have to adapt to. Uh. And uh, now, whether this is true or whether this is the ideal map, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Huh? It doesn't show that much more higher risks in, uh, in Sweden, where we did have major fires a few years ago. But it does show that uh, throughout Europe, lots parts of Europe, we see an increase in fire risk. And we also start to see fire risk in areas where we didn't have that much fires before. So we need to also look at that. Now, so. Um, again, to, to, to why should we go to adaptive fire management? Huh? I think 
similar to what are the risks are changing. We see above in time, we might get fires more often, but also in space, and those might be even more risky. Is we might get fires in places and areas where we're not prepared for it. Now, the future is uncertain, so we don't know where fires will emerge in the future. So I think that's also, we cannot have build on our historical uh, experience anymore. We need to go, we need to look beyond that. Um, old methods of suppressing and fighting fires have sometimes failed. Uh, at least I've heard enough examples. I'm not sure how broad scale that is. I also heard in some of the uh, presentations that you know, the fire protection agencies are very pressed, they have a hard time managing the current condition. And at the same time, you see, at least in some areas, uh, that people expect no fires and they, they, they do not tolerate any fires. I, I had a personal experience of that being in Portugal and they're asking them, you know, what about the fires? And people really try to play down all the risk. There weren't any fires and, and we didn't have to worry about it. So really trying to, to, to get on that. Well, it's just, you know, um, it's also about accepting these risks. So when we accept the risks, we can much easier managing these risks as well. Now, I think the, the, the building blocks of, of adaptive flood management, can they also be used for, for fire management? Uh, can, we, can we use these, uh, these building blocks? And I think some we can, for some it might be, be different for fires. Huh? But I think, when when start about you know uh, accepting future uncertainties and, and and developing different scenarios, I think for water that is a lot easier. It's easier to model floods than than fire risks. Uh, floods are still more predictable than fire. Um, but you know because it's more uncertain, uh, developing scenarios might be even more useful uh, to 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 assess the robustness of future policies and interventions. But we we try to think about what does a major fire look like. And what do we need to do to protect ourselves against might be very useful. Um, I think also for fire, it is important that, that we realize that we cannot build the future on what we've learned in the past. We have to go beyond that. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at lessons learned, but it, that's probably not enough. Um, and I think also, if we accept high uncertainty, the, the full focus on, on prevention and, and fighting, uh, we, we realize that's not possible anymore. And we need other measures uh, uh, to, to manage these increasing risks. Now, I think focus on learning by doing, um, I think that's been very important in adaptive management. We also do, we, we do more of that, I must say, in, in, in developing countries than we do in the Netherlands. On, on, on the more learning by doing, but I think it's, it's, it is important that you start with some issues uh, small scale. Um, I think there, there, uh, there's a nice example on adaptive fire management initiative in Victoria, Australia, which is also very much focusing on that learning. Huh? Uh, so learn people, what is fire? What can you do about it? What can I do uh, as a person or as a family? What can we do as a community? Huh? But I also saw that until now, most learning is focused on talking and exchanging knowledge and not about experimenting. So what are we going to do, uh, you know, go into the fields and, uh, what, you know, uh, what is a good way to reduce these, uh, these fire risks? Um, now, um, acknowledge possibility of future shocks. I think that, you know, uh, most big fires are naturally shocks. So, uh, but by doing that, you, you realize that you need to increase uh, resilience, you might need to create additional safety margins, which can also be more financially or, or as, a, as a community. Um, now, reversible and flexible options, I think that we can also use. Huh? Um, you can implement strategies stepwise when, when the climate might change more or the landscape might change more. Um, if you take a sort of adaptive pathway approach, where we've been very successful with that in, in water management, you look at your, where do you want to end up in the future? How do you get there? It's also important that you do not create what we call in water management or adaptive unnecessary lock-ins. And part of that is if you look at land management is that you do not build, for example, cities, which might become vulnerable to floods or fires in the, in, in the future. But that you keep that area open huh, uh, for, for later, uh, basically filling it in. 
win-win options. Uh, I think especially between fire management and ecology, there might be a lot of win-wins, uh, but also maybe with some options with agriculture. Um, and, and, and finally, in this, these adaptation pathways uh, which have been developed in water management could be very useful for fire management, especially if, it's, if there's a complex and large set of measures that you want to implement. These pathways can help you when and how to implement those. Now that was my uh, uh, presentation from here. Uh, I hope that was uh, that was useful. And finally, I, I very much look forward to be uh, to be involved in this uh, project with a very interesting team. Well, well, thank you, Fulco. And I can tell you it was a great presentation because in the background here we've been scurrying around because the questions have been flowing in. Um, and that was an awful pun about water, but. I uh, want to actually get right at them because there are a bunch and, and they are qu quite good. Um, Andy Elliott asked, um, extreme flood and wildfire events are infrequent in Northern Europe, uh, but climate change is said to increase the frequency and severity of both. Which type of event, flood or fire, flood or wildfire, excuse me, do you see as the greatest challenge in the future? No, I, I think for the Netherlands it is fire because we focus so much on flood. We are prepared for the floods, but I think we underestimating the risk of uh, of fire still still in the Netherlands. I mean, we've been so much focused on floods and and wet events that I think the dry and the heat. I mean, I think we're changing now because we've had these these heat waves and droughts, and and maybe we we've been sort of lucky that uh, that the major fires happened in Sweden and not in the Netherlands. But I think there, uh, the, the fires are uh, uh, also a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, I think on the fires themselves, um, uh, Catherine asks, how are farmers compensated once their fields are flooded again? And this, you know, Room for Water was showing some examples there. How can farmers become allies in this process rather than vic victims of displacement? Uh, and she says she uh, she thinks this also can apply to living with fire. Um, have you seen examples of that? And how are the farmers um, uh, treated in that system? Yeah, it depends a little bit. So some of these systems, they use them in the summer and they're flooded in the winter. So that's, that's uh, mm. um, um, that can be, I mean, the, the, the compensation is especially where we see that farmland becomes sort of overflow land. Huh? So it used to be very well protected, but now it's, it's basically assigned as an overflow area. And there you do see extreme protests uh, by the farmers. And I think that the issue here is the compensation for a single flood is relatively easy, but the compensation of the value of the land is a much more difficult one. I think that 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 might also the case, you know, if your area, you know, your farm burns, it might actually reduce the value of the farm itself. And that's what we see with, with, with this with flooded areas. The minute that there's even a plan that, that areas in the Netherlands are, you know, if it becomes part of, a, of an overflow area, the, the value of the land reduces. And that's very difficult to compensate. Um, but the compensation for single floods and single droughts events, those have been very, very well managed in the Netherlands, I think, throughout Europe. There's, there's, there's large amount of funds, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on that idea of management, uh, Pooja asked a question. It's based on that Room for Water uh, a project that you, you were doing. And she says, it's just a doubt. Uh, how does adapting uh, the strategy of straightening the rivers uh, become helpful because as far as, as she knows, not all the river restoration projects have been successful. And specifically give an example, the Beverly Brook River in London was heavily modified, affecting the ecological status. Uh, obviously there are, there are a lot of variables involved in these things. So, so how yeah, um, how is that dealt no, with, you know? No, I think the, the interesting, I mean, the, the, the the, the first kind of space for the river kind of project was actually a, 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 a nature creation project. So it started off almost by developing nature and then, then it was really taken over by, by the flood management. So it, it doesn't always help. Huh? Uh, there might be also, especially the pollution issues involved, it might be, I don't know the Beverly Brook example, uh, but straightening the river is definitely not good for ecology. Um, as we, you know, we, you saw the example also there, they were removing obstacles, which might also be trees, which might not be very good for the ecological status. 
But I think in the Netherlands, a lot of these projects by giving more space for the river have been have increased the ecological status of, of the yeah. area. Yeah. 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 Very good. And, and let me just ask if you can stop sharing your screen, you know, the PowerPoints, yeah. it'll actually make your image a bit larger uh, on the screen there and people uh, can uh, enjoy yeah. seeing you more. Yeah. There you are. Very nice. Uh, two questions uh, actually on modeling, which are quite good. Uh, Marty Alexander asks one in the wild in wildfire. We have fire growth models, uh, Farsight, Prometheus, Spark. Are there similar models in water management? No, yes, there are definitely. So there is, uh, you know, I think in water management and in flood management and also looking at impacts of climate change, there's a, there's a very large set of models that have been developed. And, 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 and water management has been heavily dependent on, on these modeling systems. Uh, and that's, and especially then basing that on historical data. That's also why I showed this paper on stationarity is that, that this, 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 this building on historical data and, and models, flood models or water resource models have been, um, have been very useful. So yes, there is a lot of modeling also in, in water management, which is, I mean, I've been involved in, in climate change impacts where we did both water and kind of fire uh, growth models and, uh, or, or, or fire risk models. So yes, there are, yeah. Very good. And um, Catalina Stoof asks, um, an easy question maybe, is water easier to model than fire? <laughs> I think so, yeah. I, Good I, luck I, with that. <laughs> I, well, I, know more, I know a lot more about water, of course, than fire, but I think they are. I mean, you know, if you get a lot of rain and it runs off and you get a flood. I mean, you don't know if it's, if, if it's dry and, and you, you know, you get a lot of uh, lightning that you do get, uh, uh, but I that you do get more fires. But I mean, if you look at it a larger uh, areas and, and over larger data set, it might be equally possible. But I think it's easier to predict where the flood will occur than to, to clearly predict where the fire will occur. But yeah. Good. Um, Karen asked a question that is actually a great one. I, I was thinking about it as well when you're giving your presentation about uncertainty and about the issue of, of how different people perceive it. Um, says uh, you mentioned that scientists are quite uh, accepting of future uncertainty, but it's hard for politicians to accept this. Uh, perhaps uh, it proposes we need to change the narrative of communicating uncertainty outside of science. Do you know if the Netherlands has any success in framing uncertainty in flood modeling in a way that is more accepting generally? Are there lessons we can learn for uh, communicating uncertainty in wildfire? And I think, you know, especially to those elected officials, uh, and even if you want to expand talking about Vietnam and Bangladesh, where you've worked, um, you know, how have you seen that in those different areas? Because uh, it's uh, wrestling with that, uh, it's very important. Um, so I've, I've, I think we, we talk a lot more about, about vulnerability, robustness and resilience. Um, and and, and, and we, can, we can talk a lot more about what we do know for certain so we know for certain that fire risk will increase maybe that's what we should communicate we know uh but we also know for certain that some measures will make us what well, you know what make us more robust against these structural risks so maybe we should we should talk more in in terms of of solutions than really in terms of uh, of uncertainties um and and that is habited but as yeah, as scientists, we also try to be, you know, we are, we are honest, we want, to, we want to tell the full story, which might take attention away from the real message that we want to take. But I think for us, we're talking about robustness and more certainty can also help. Yeah. Very good. Um, James uh, Dacey asks, uh, can you name any landscape solutions that have benefited, uh, excuse me, can you name any landscape solutions that have benefits from mitigating against both flood, flooding and wildfire in the same environmental space, either real world examples or proposals for the future? Ooh, that's a... I suppose if you have a wildfire, you could flood it and put it out. No, no. Uh, the, uh, I think he's looking for, um, and it's very much a, a, a no, core here of our life. You know, how can both of those landscapes, you know, be seen in the same way for wildfire, for flooding? I mean, we've seen examples where at least they're negative. I mean, if you have a fire and then you have a flood, so I mean, often fires re reduce the retention of an area. Um, so, um, so there, uh, um, so by at least preventing 
fires or you know well, at least the major fires i mean maybe we have to we have to make sure that if there is a fire that not everything burns to the ground and that we could do with with different kind of methods so we so we prevent also the future floods uh, because it, a, a recently burned area has a much lower infiltration capacity um but um um yeah I mean, maybe some of the fire management that we that they do in in savannas might help both more the the, the water and the, the 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 fire management. Yeah. So. Very good. Um, and, and actually, on that, Pooja has a, a question that I think it builds on what you were talking about with management strategies. Uh, it says, if we adapt flood management strategies, some of them, to deal with fire issues, do you think we would face the same kind of challenges or more in the planning process for fire management? I do. I do think you you get the same kind of you know issues um, that it depends a little bit where. But if you've been in an area where you know, as a as a government or as a firefighting, you know, we you know we 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 aim to reduce your fire risk to zero, and that's what we're here for. Eh? <laughs> uh, same with with, with the, uh, the 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 um, the floods. Eh? Uh, the Netherlands, you know, our government has always said to the, to their population, you know, we protect you against fly, uh, uh, floods. Yeah, we don't have flood insurance because. Mm. This is what the government takes care of. And now you say to them, hey, no, well, maybe you need to accept some risk. Or maybe where you live now, this is actually an overflow area where you might actually get water if we haven't high. And those are situations where, where people need to get deal with. Or, you know, you're partly responsible for the problem. What are you going to And I think the same with fire is, you know, you need to take some control as a person or as a community to, to mitigate part of the risks. You might, you know, you might get some... Uh, some similar some similar problems at the same time you might get uh, great opportunities as well you know where people start to work together communicate together and, and look at solutions uh, which are more supportive you know, very good. Uh, just two questions left, and then we're going to uh, move to uh, some other things. But Karen asks, um, it says you have some really great examples of utilizing climate and hydrological modeling in planning for the future. Uh, the lack of long-term wildfire data seems to be a challenge for many countries. What can we do to start a plan for wildfire in the future with incomplete data? Yeah, well, well, we, we, I mean, it's, you know, my, my hardcore hydrological friends would say the same thing for hydrology. Yeah, we don't have data, we cannot do anything. I think we've, we've, we've done very well. We're doing very well with also predicting risks, uh, also in areas with limited data. Um, so they're, they're, of course, you know, the more data you have, the better it is. But, but even without data, you probably know uh, what causes, what increases your fire risk. You can still look at what, what, you know what's what changes fire risk in the future uh, there can be changes in, in temperatures and heat waves in uh, there's just there's getting more risks of of lightning as well in the future so i think you can still you can still map some of the risk with incomplete data what we also have done is um is work with people where in your area do you think that our risk is a high risk for for fires so that's the uh, uh yeah very good. And uh, just finally, um, uh, someone had uh, uh, anonymously typed in uh, the, the, can you uh, share the source of the risk maps uh, that you have on slide 28? I think they like them and just wanted to know where they came from. Um, I think this is work from the joint program, uh, joint research center, GRC. Right. From, uh, yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Foco, very much for this, uh, uh, this session. It was, um, uh, really informative, and I think again brings together th this this layer between the lessons of flood and the lessons that then be given to fire. And I we've, we've heard that both uh, very well from both of you this morning. Um, I do want to uh, move to closing, and we, and we have something very special today, and we'll be continuing this through all the webinars. Uh, two of the uh, PhD candidates will be introducing themselves, uh, explaining. Um, 
their their study area, and I think you'll be just fascinated with what uh, these these students are looking at, uh, and then uh, give a bit of a, a, a talk about what will be happening next week. So uh, Judith Kirshner is is one of the um, uh, PhD uh, candidates, and I want to introduce her uh, and have her explain a bit about what she's doing, and then Mario Tapia will come on after and also share with you a bit about uh, next week's webinar. So hi, Judith, there you are. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Judith. I'm from South Germany, and I'm one of the 15 PhD candidates working with PyroLife on increasing our knowledge of fires in Europe. And my PhD project within PyroLife is about fires and governance. So that means I'm looking into rules and regulations made up by different countries and also organizations like the European Union to increase wildfire resilience. And that includes policies on responding to fires and avoid fatalities, but also on how to prevent them in the long term. So one example would be if countries are allowed to do prescribed burns and who is responsible for doing that. And I'm also looking at different approaches and methods of other risks, like what we just heard, like policies from flooding and water management or other natural hazards like storms and avalanches and what can we learn from that for fires. And a couple of words on my background. I did my bachelor's in environmental management and my master's in earth sciences with the focus on paleo fires. And my host institution within PyroLife is the European University in Cyprus. Thank you. Very great, wonderful, and yeah, fascinating stuff. Uh, Mario, uh, wanted to introduce you as well and uh, have you uh, talk about yourself, but also share uh, what we'll be hearing next week. All right. Thank you, Lucien. Hello, my name is Mario Tapia, and I am the early stage researcher or the Pyro Life candidate um, working on the project Fire Behavior in Temperate North Northwestern Europe. Um, I'll be working with the fire consultancy Techno Silva in Leon, Spain. And my role is to assess how North, Northwest European fuels and uh, moisture conditions differ from uh, those in the Mediterranean and to witness how, and to research how this impacts fire behavior in the region and to see whether these changes are meaningful, dif meaningfully dif different. And hopefully in the end, I'll improve current uh, fire behavior models, which will eventually aid in uh, firefighting and research within this area. Yeah. And I'd like to I'd like to conclude with introduce with uh, discussing our speakers for next week, which will be uh, Alexander Held, who's a senior expert at the European Forest Institute. We'll be talking about how fires are currently um, operating in the northwestern Europe area, and also Paulo Fernandez uh, with UTAD who will be discussing extreme wildfires in the European South. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us and I hope to see you all there next week. Very good. Yes, thank you everyone and have a good week.